Welcome to the FitFile podcast, where you're going to hear about anything and everything sports tech related, whether that's smart watches, sports watches, health wearables, bike trainers, trainer apps, and basically anything that you can use to level up your health, fitness, and sports game. For those not familiar with Des and I, Des of DesFit on YouTube, uh, and myself, Ray of DCRainmaker.com, as well as DC Rainmaker on YouTube. Uh, we focus on sports technology, so everything from wearables like GPS watches to uh, cycle computers, as well as trainers and and action cameras and drones, anything in that realm that covers sports technology, even sometimes just at the fringe of that, uh, we're gonna cover here on the podcast. And in terms of where to find the FitFile podcast, so we publish on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as YouTube. And one advantage to seeing us on YouTube is that we're gonna have B-roll of some of the products that we talk about on these episodes, which adds basically a little bit of context to what we're talking about. Now, one of those sources that we've added in the last couple of days at your request is the YouTube music side of things. Uh, so you may know that Google Podcasts, the app, the platform, whatever you want to call it, is going away in April. Uh, and in place of that is YouTube music. Uh, and what's notable here is that the way we've added it, you can listen to both as an audio podcast or seamlessly switch over to the video side if you want to check out all that cool magical B-roll that will splice in here and there. All right, so for our second episode of the FitFile Reboot, so we've got a lot to talk about today. So Wahoo has released their Wahoo Kicker Run treadmill. There's Peak Zwift Day. Chorus released a whole bunch of updates for pretty much the majority of their watches. Fossil is quitting the smartwatch game. Garmin takes a jab at Apple. And then we also have some other miscellaneous stuff that we'll talk about in this video. So I guess, first of all, let's go ahead and talk about Wahoo's new Kicker Run treadmill. Yeah, so it's it's pretty amazing. I think, you know, both you and I have now since tried it, uh, since the announcement there. And the, the long list short of it there is that they're, they've obviously getting into making a treadmill, as the name implies. Uh, but it's not just any treadmill. So you've got like the core treadmill specs, uh, and then you got all this other technology layered on top of it. Uh, so just very briefly from a core treadmill spec standpoint, uh, it goes up to... 15 miles an hour, so considerably faster than the usual 12 to 12 and a half miles an hour of most treadmills. And I know I'm saying miles an hour, and that's really annoying for everyone outside the US, uh, but that's just the way most treadmills are spec these days and how you talk about treadmills. Um, just for context, though, 15 miles an hour is a four minute mile pace or about a 230 or so kilometer pace. So uh, it's cooking along. We'll talk about why the speed matters, that little difference between 12 and 15 miles an hour in, in a minute, if we remember. Um, Beyond that, the incline is 15% as well, I believe, correct? Um, yep, goes down to negative three. Negative three percent, also notable. And then it's belt driven as opposed to slat driven. Uh, and then it has a little bit bigger deck than you normally see in terms of belt length uh, compared to some of the competitors. Um, but most of that stuff is all kind of like generic spec stuff. The real magic here is in some of the software integration. Uh, so first off on connectivity to apps like Zwift and really any other app out there, as well as pretty much anything you want to connect to from a watch standpoint, uh, can all connect to it over uh, Amp Plus or Bluetooth Smart or Wi-Fi or Ethernet. I mean, it's literally got like every connectivity option out there. And again, some treadmills today have had that, but not anywhere near the extent of this. And then you start to move towards those holy grail features, you get into things like both gradient control and Zwift, which is a big one, as well as speed control, uh, which is incredibly rare uh, for treadmills to allow speed control and virtually unheard of to allow speed control outside of their own app ecosystem. And I think that's something that should be noted about this treadmill is that this is definitely not Wahoo taking another treadmill off their shelf and just rebranding it as a Wahoo treadmill. Yep. Like this is absolutely their own hardware. And they did a very impressive job so far on coming out with this thing. So uh, in terms of my initial impressions of it, it was very much... Uh, on par with the quality of the commercial grade treadmills that I see at the gym, if not actually exceeding the quality there. Something that really took me by surprise was just how solid the unit was. Like with some treadmills, when you get on them, even at the gym, like you're kind of worried about something that's gonna fall apart. With this treadmill, oh my gosh, like this was like you were running on the road. It was that solid. And then in terms of the actual construction and whatnot, I think both of us were actually running on prototypes of the treadmill at this point. And it was a very finished product in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. They, they mentioned when I, ran on up back a little while ago that there was some like fit and finish stuff. Like they were going to change a little bit of these sidewall materials in terms of what you just to finish on it. So it didn't, I guess, grab like sweat and stuff a different way. And then some of the welds run perfect on this prototype. And, and they're aiming to uh, release this in June to start shipping it in June to North America. And then the rest of the world about a year later. Uh, and, you know, I first mentioned that to my wife, the, the time frame. she's like, well, how do you list a treadmill in June? Um, but it actually makes sense because what it allows you to do is to sort out all of the distribution 
hell that comes with shipping large objects um, and having you know a white glove install service or bring it into your house to set it up. Start that out over the course of the summer, and that way you're really ready to rock and roll for those kind of late fall uh, orders into the typical winter running season on treadmills. Uh, though I still think, just like we saw with indoor trainers, I have a feeling this is going to start to shift that a little bit. And that uh, myself, I am, I own, I guess, two treadmills now. Um, that, but despite that, I don't really love running on treadmills. I only do it when I absolutely have to. Uh, usually when it's like just horrific sideways rain type weather, like just like one degree above freezing. Um, or if I have like a time constraint uh, with, you know, making sure the kids are being watched. And last night was actually a great example of that where um, it was beautiful weather, like actually the nicest weather of the year so far. Uh, but I just couldn't fit it in my schedule. And so by the time I got home and needed to watch the kids and, and take care of them, uh, this didn't really fit in to go out for a run and leave them alone. Uh, but they were able to play while I was on the treadmill and it worked out just perfect. So yeah, so that's the basics of the Wahoo Kicker Run treadmill. But let's talk about really the highlight feature of this treadmill, and that's their new run free mode. So what this allows you to do is basically run naturally at whatever speed that you want to run, and the treadmill automatically adjusts the belt speed based on your body position. And how it does this is that there's a time of flight sensor on the front of the treadmill that essentially is measuring the distance of your body to the treadmill. So if you start to run faster, you get closer to that sensor and the belt starts to speed up. And if you start to run slower, well, you'll move back on the belt and the belt at that point starts to go slower. And the crazy thing about this is that it's taking these measurements, I think 1000 times a second, and it's making yep. these changes like basically instantaneously. And it, certainly does take a few minutes for you to kind of trust that it's actually going to speed up or slow down. Like, you know, you're just like, all right, so I'm going to start to move a little faster. Is this actually going to accommodate or am I going to run into the front of the treadmill? And same thing with running slower. It's like, am I actually just going to get booted off the back of the treadmill? But my initial impressions of it, you know, I'll put the literally my first reaction on the screen right now, but it took quite a few seconds to process how well it worked. It's impressive. I think there's two different scenarios where it was super impressive to me. One was doing uh, repeats on the track. Um, so I ran for, I think, like an hour, hour and a half or so before I sort of filmed my video, just all sorts of different things. And I did repeats on the track. They were 800s uh, and also 400s. And I did the 400s in like 430 a mile or something like that. And then the 800s, I did a 530 a mile. And it was interesting to, on the, the 531s in run free mode because I would then go down to basically a walk pace for the recovery. And you can see the very first, I think I included this in my second video. You see the very first time that I trusted it to stop, I was like hesitating because I didn't really trust it would stop that fast because I'm just so used to treadmills going between those paces being like 18 to 20 seconds to like slowly ramp back down again. And you almost see me not like trip, but almost like I was bracing to fall off the back. And it did. I, it, in two and a half seconds, it went from 530 mile to walk and I stayed on the treadmill the entire time. And it's it's super cool. And that, in some ways, as cool as the feature, the ability that Zwift will now have to control the treadmill speeds, uh, effectively recreating like an erg mode workout on a treadmill, um, which is not something we typically see third-party apps being able to do. Uh, usually it's only first-party apps. Uh, as cool as that is, this is almost better because it feels more realistic, right? I don't, I don't need the treadmill to hold that pace because I don't need to touch anything. I just run and it just magically keeps itself there. But for me, the most impressive feature was cresting this hill and this course that they had laid out where, you know, you went up this long climb and then you get to the top and it starts, the treble starts to kind of start to pitch down a little bit slowly uh, from whatever was 8% up to basically negative 3% down. And that combined with the TV being right in front of the treadmill. And just as you crested over the top there, the treadmill went down and most importantly, you started running faster naturally because you were going downhill and it just felt natural. Like I went from, you know, a, a nine minute mile or so going up this hill, just slogging around and then down to a five something a minute mile flying down the hill. And again, I'm sorry for all you metric people. Uh, I went from slow to fast. That's all you really need to know here. <laughs> No, it's uh, that experience is really impressive. And uh, again, it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around how well it simulates that sort of experience where, again, like when you crest the hill and you start to go down in real life, your legs just naturally start to turn over faster. And that's exactly what happened. And again, it's there's definitely a trust factor in it where you're just like, OK, well, 
I'm just starting to turn over so much faster and am I gonna run to the front of this treadmill? And you can see from the videos, either from Ray or myself, that basically our just legs are just starting to turn over and it just feels so incredibly natural. So uh, I think that they're obviously did a lot of work with Zwift to kind of get this type of integration happening. And I don't know, I, I, it's, it's very impressive implementation overall. So yeah, it was interesting when I, when I walked into Wahoo's headquarters, uh, Chip Hawkins, our CEO, said to me, um, as we kind of routed the corner towards the treadmill, um, and I'd known about it before then, they had, we had a conference call on it, but you know, I hadn't like actually seen it in real life yet. He said, just, just so you know, Ray, uh, I'm probably <laughs> going to cost you a lot of money. Uh, he's like, anyone who's running this thus far wants to buy one immediately. Like there's, there's no one that's come in here and been like, yeah, so, so, um, and it's true. Like. I rebuy a lot of equipment, um, and I'm already looking at this like it's really cool. Uh, I I think I'll <laughs> I'll probably buy one at some point. Yeah, it's stuff. That's yeah. So that's what I was going to bring up next was price. So the Wahoo yeah. Kicker Run. So it's going to run five thousand dollars, and you know you obviously can get treadmills as low as eight hundred to a thousand dollars, and those are just you know very consumer grade treadmills, and okay. um, you know most commercial grade treadmills they start around three to four thousand dollars and go up to well over ten thousand dollars. What's really interesting though, is that, you know, I was looking at some of the $10,000 treadmills out there just for comparison. And I've run on a lot of those. I would buy this at $5,000 oh, yeah. all day long over some of those $10,000 options. I, I, I mean, like, again, like I was just so impressed by the build quality. Hopefully that will transfer over to, you know, a more mass production aspect, but uh, again, like, you know, from the build quality, the features, I thought five thousand dollars was uh, hitting a really, really nice price point. Absolutely, I think that's one of the things. There's basically two two groups of comments that I've seen on this over the last week. Uh, number one is people that don't necessarily understand the treadmill market are like five thousand dollars is crazy. Like you said, I can buy a treadmill much much cheaper than that. Um, but the challenge with that is there's two different components of those one thousand to three thousand dollar treadmills. I have a couple of three thousand dollar treadmills, and uh, they're perfectly fine but they don't have the top speed. And that's a that's a sort of big deal depending on how fast a runner you are. Um, if you want to do a lot of intervals, 12.5 miles an hour isn't actually that fast for like your front of the package 5K runner. Like if you have a someone that's going to win your local 5K, a 12.5 mile an hour treadmill isn't going to do it for their training. Um, and it might not do it for like a not quite the front of the packer either, depends on what they're doing. Um, but it's also stability. And so again, if you have a six, seven hour old treadmill, they tend to be a little more wobbly. Um, and then from a pricing <laughs> step, to put it nicely, and then from a pricing standpoint- I was gonna say it's a wild ride. <laughs> yes, you're right, you're right. It's, it's a different kind of movement experience there. Um, and generally speaking, you won't hit that 15 miles an hour until you hit $10,000. Like there's a weird gap between essentially, you know, a $3,000 treadmill and a $10,000 treadmill where that's like a massive no man's land there. Um, and then once you hit $10,000, you also don't get the connectivity that you still have in this here. Um, and of course, the stability, et cetera. And so it's one of those things where the treble industry hasn't really changed in like 20, if not 30 years. Um, I mean, there's really nothing changed there. Uh, and it's, I think this is a bit of a wake up call. I um, mean, Wahoo's done wake up calls in the past, right? The, the kicker eventually put the copy train around company out of business, um, which was like the de facto standard in smart trainers uh, more than a decade ago. Um, and I'm not saying Wahoo's going to come along and put everyone else out of business. That's silly. Um, but I think they have they have opportunity to um, really kind of just make a lot of money on this, I think. Yeah. Uh, and they will be making money from me as well. Uh, so I... I got done with my hour and a half run on it at the Boston Run Show, and I talked to my Wahoo contact. I'm like, all right, so how much is this going to cost me, and when can I get it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, exactly. So um, last thing I wanted to bring up is, uh, have you spent much time on the self-propelled curved treadmills like a Woodway or a Techno Gym or something like that? Every time I have, I regret my life choices. I just I just don't like them. <laughs> I, it's, there's like three types of treadmills, right? There is belt driven, there's slat driven, and then there's manual or self-propelled, which I'm sure you'll talk about here in a second. And for me personally, I tend to like the belt driven ones. I find the slat ones um, tend to feel like too bouncy and too just 
feels weird to me. Um, and then the, the manual ones just feel like a lot of, they just don't feel right to me, but that's my two mm-hmm. cents. Yeah, no, actually I like belt driven quite a bit as well. Uh, with belt driven treadmills to replicate the propulsion that you would do outside. Generally, a lot of people will put the treadmill at a grade of like a half or 1% to kind of replicate that a little bit of propulsion with the self propelled treadmills. I actually tend to like those for the most part in the sense that you are propelling yourself forward. The strange thing about the self propelled treadmills is that it's a curve and the front of the curve, it makes it feel that you're also pulling as well, which right. that part doesn't feel natural to me. Plus they're very, very loud too. So I I kind of like to switch back and forth between the two because uh, between a belt driven and self propelled, just because I think, you know, you're, you're just like indoor cycling, you're never gonna truly replicate your outdoor experience. So um, you kind of get different experiences on both of them. And so that's why I do like to kind of mix things up a little bit between the two. But considering that self-propelled treadmills are in that $3,000-ish range, I, you know, 3,000 to 5,000, that's a big jump. It really, really is. But considering the additional features that the Kicker Run has, uh, for me, I would prefer to spend that $5,000. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see what what happens. Um, I think, you know, We've talked a lot of good things. Uh, let's talk about some of the not so good things. Um, I think sure. number one is Wahoo has a very checkered at best um, history when it comes to first gen products, uh, and primarily from a not from a software standpoint, but from a hardware reliability, hardware quality assurance, you name it, standpoint. Um, and so that is certainly a, a very valid concern. Um, we saw that with a kicker bike V1. Uh, and it really took to the kicker bike V2 and we're seeing elements of that with the kicker bike shift and in a much smaller scale, I think. Um, and we've seen it on, on other products as well. There is a kicker core, for example, when it first came out, it was a, it was a really rough go of things. Uh, so that's number one. And that's something that I don't think we're really going to know until about a year or so later. I'm like, that's, you know, we'll have an initial, like the units that, you know, they send out for reuse to you and I. Um, will likely be double checked and triple checked though, as this week has proven from a number of companies that is certainly not usually the case. Um, I have like, <laughs> we'll I spent so many later. hours today <laughs> on things we can't talk about today on broken stuff that like literally everything I tested today in three different companies, I've had to get replacement units on. Um, so for anyone who thinks we need to do, we need to do an episode on the fallacies of product reviews and what people think and how it actually works because. Oh yeah, oh. I think we'll name that episode. So you really want to be a sports tech reviewer, <laughs> oh, man? I I literally, uh, you know, GP Llama, Shane Miller, and I spent the entire morning texting trying to troubleshoot stuff. Um, so just again, he is still in our lives on a daily basis, and uh, and not just one <laughs> thing, but three different products trying to troubleshoot this morning. Uh, so, um, anyways, that aside, I, I assume from a quality hardware quality standpoint that they will probably have reasonably well-produced units that they'll get to us for reviews, et cetera. Um, but we won't really know until about a year later uh, in terms of the longevity, the life of that hardware and how it starts to stand up. Obviously, these are things designed for many years, which gets to the second problem, which is the warranty. Um, and right now, yeah. the the warranty that Wahoo is talking about just is not sufficient for um, the competition. I mean, uh, they're you know talking like a one to two year warranty, depending on the parts, um, what part you're talking about, which I mean, Peloton, their Peloton tread at 2,500 to 30,000 bucks, depending on what time of year, what time of day you buy it at, um, starts at like three to six years to, for which components you're looking at. Like it's, or it's the three to five years, sorry, which components plus the ability to add relatively cheaply, um, extra, you know, warranty years beyond that. Um, and Wahoo hasn't really sorted out any of that. And I think that's a, a very valid concern when you start talking something with so many parts that can go wrong over a longer period of time. So they've they've been developing this product for numerous years at this point too. So they are aware that quality concerns are out there from consumers who have gotten bitten by previous products. So I think that's definitely top of mind for them. So you know, hopefully, whenever this comes out, June, July you know, it's probably going to be okay if it comes out in the fall, realistically, yeah. as long as they can get all their, yeah, as long as they're get, they can get all their ducks in a row and just make sure that this thing is truly ready to go. 
this could be a really good, cool product in this space. Super cool. The last two things that are of note there that could be concerns um, outside of timeline is both uh, patent stuff um, as well as uh, any safety regulation bits that may like sneak up on them. Um, from a safety standpoint, they talked a lot about what they're doing and how uh, their logic gets them in a much better position than most other treadmill companies for the automatic uh, pace control. That's why so many treadmill companies are so afraid of that is uh, because obviously primarily in the U.S. market, um, you know, people get sued all the time for the silliest of things. And so that's something they're trying to mitigate um, and try not to obviously have someone fly off the back of the treadmill. And they talked to like someone asked the other day, what happens if you put a towel over that sensor? Will it all of a sudden detect that you're right against it and fly really fast? And they said, no, they, they detect that there's something artificially blocking it and they do all sorts of stuff like that. So that's one concern that I have. Not from a safety standpoint, but will there be some like bumps in the road that slows them down to get to launch? Um, and the mm -hmm. second piece is that uh, the treadmill landscape has so many patents out there, and a lot of those patents are held by Icon, um, who has a bunch of different sub brands beneath them, and they are known as one of the biggest industry patent trolls out there in this area. And so, will will Wahoo run into some challenges there from a patent standpoint? And Again, Wahoo is very familiar with uh, patent law over the last year and a half or so, um, and I'm sure they've done their homework, but I'm also sure that companies like Icon would love to to deal some, to do something about that. Sure, yeah. Well, so yeah, that's the Wahoo Kicker run. Uh, both of us are eager to get more miles on that, so to be determined. <laughs> uh, so next up, we're going to talk about another indoor training thing. So we're going to talk about Peak Zwift Day. So this is a Tuesday that lands in January that what basically has the most Zwift riders at mm -hmm. one time. And I was actually on there at the time. I saw mm -hmm. around 20,000 people uh, during the time I was riding. So uh, I guess tell yep. us a little bit more about Peak Zwift Day. Yeah, so typically speaking, Peak Zwift Day happens on a Tuesday in January um, and usually the second or third Tuesday and usually around 7 p.m. Central European time or around one o'clock uh, U.S. Eastern time, and and the reason for that is a whole like convergence of a lot of different factors. Uh, number one, being January, it's usually the worst uh, month of the year in terms of weather for the Northern Hemisphere, which is where the vast majority of uh, Zwifters live. Uh, number two, uh, Tuesday is the busiest day of the week uh, when it comes to uh, Zwifters and people being online. Number three gets to the evening aspect of it, uh, and so. That time frame, that roughly 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. is sort of the, uh, again, Central European time, is sort of the, the biggest peak of users because you have people in Central Europe and then the UK uh, coming online. The UK is uh, about an hour behind. So 7 p.m. is 7 p.m. Paris, Amsterdam, et cetera. But 6 p.m. in the UK. And then you also have people doing lunch rides in the US uh, and then scatter folks around the rest of the world. So it's like the best possible time you can get to have the most number of users. As for why usually the second or third January of Tuesday, it's because that's when Zwift holds a lot of like these tour to Zwift type events uh, that have big followings of people that show up at the same time there. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, you could probably layer on the fact that uh, it's January as well. So there's a lot of yep. resolutions happening and a lot of people probably trying to burn off some holiday calories. And then the Tuesday aspect comes into play where Monday tends to be a rest day for a lot of people. So Tuesday is you know when they hop back on and why this is not a weekend. This could possibly be situations where you know people have family stuff going on, on the weekends, maybe they're trying to get outside, et cetera, stuff like that. So uh, what happened in terms of the numbers, or I guess what's the history in terms of the numbers with Peak yep. Swift Day and what happened this year? Yeah, so Peak Swift Day, as I mentioned, is almost always that Tuesday or so in January. Uh, the, looking at the, the data we have, it goes back about six, seven years now. Um, before that, there's not really much data around that. But uh, 2018, Peak Swift was 8,500 users. Uh, 2019, Peak Swift was about 13,000 users. Uh, 2020, Peak Swift was 34,940 users, about 35,000 users. Ironically, a rare peak swift though in April, because again, 2020, COVID, that's when it, it happened. And uh, that sounds like that peak swift, I was talking to Zip folks, that peak swift was actually tied to like a pro group ride that went on that day. Like a pro rider was part of this group ride, a thing that it hit oh. it that day. Um, 
2021, though, was peak swift back to January again of 29,114. Um, in that case, that was also tied to a pro rider type uh, a protein event that happened again in, on a Tuesday night. So just like just pile on factor. Um, and you imagine like these numbers are in the, in the low 40s. Uh, and so if you have one extra group ride that brings in an extra five or 7,000 people, uh, that's just enough to like really to bump that up there. Um, then you get to 2022 and it dipped down to 42,000. Uh, so you see the, the post COVID bubble starting to happen there. 2023 down further to 40,039. And then finally 2024. And this was interesting because I thought I, everyone thought it was going to happen on the second Tuesday. So the first Tuesday came along, uh, and that was at, uh, 40,452. Um, so, and better than last year, but basically the same as 2022. Then the second Tuesday came along. The weather was horrible across most of Central Europe with snow and uh, miserable winds. Like it was a prime day for this to like just nail it. But it fizzled at only 41,861. So it, it was not even <clears throat> beating the first one. However, third Tuesday come along, which was ironically decent weather across most of Europe. Um, and it was up to 43,387. Uh, and while it's plausible, uh, we could see another one at some other point it's extremely unlikely like as as each week passes out you know in january you just the weather's nicer i mean today um it's beautiful out like it's you're gonna you're gonna lose people that are gonna go outside and squeak that ride in over lunch break or some other time of day um and those those numbers matter yeah and uh in the states at least too we've had some very strange weather this year where We've had a lot of 60 degree days. Uh, literally yesterday for us here in Colorado, it was 60 degrees. So although I did actually do a short Zwift ride, I just absolutely had to get outside. So I don't know. Weather absolutely could have something to do with it. I'm 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 actually surprised that it wasn't considerably higher, considering Zwift has been pulling in a lot of new users to the platform. Yep. So I'm I'm a bit surprised it wasn't higher. Yeah, I think uh, I'm surprised. I know Zwift is surprised as well. I talked to them both before and after, and they were kind of, they thought that was like that second Tuesday with all the things going on. I thought that was prime for a, a really strong number. I don't think anyone thought it would break 50, which is effectively the, the previous record, um, you know, 49, mm -hmm. 114. Um, but I think people thought it might be in the upper 40s, and it just didn't happen. Uh, you know, one of the things Zwift talked a little bit about, Zwift hasn't released publicly their current subscriber base, right? So Zwift often talks about how millions of users have used the platform. And that's true, they have. But in terms of paying users, that's a much, much smaller number. Um, and the current estimate and guesstimate from most people in the industry is in like the nines, give or take, 900,000 range of paying Zwift users, uh, only because if Zwift were to be over a million, they'd probably note that. Um, like it's a, it's a good like feather in their hat. Uh, other platforms like Peloton um, is, you know, in the five or so million range, give or take. So just for context on where <laughs> things stand. Um, you know, Zwift is not the biggest, biggest dog out there, the biggest endurance dog for sure, but not the biggest like indoor cycling platform, if you will. Um, but one of the things they kind of noted is that while everyone in this industry has seen a softening of the subscriber numbers, uh, and that post COVID, uh, bubble, um, in terms of like, you know, people moving from indoor training to other things again, um, that they didn't really see necessarily a complete drawback in the number of subscribers. It's just that they saw like the, the growth rate start to flatten out. Um, and so it sounds like with what they're saying is that their people are still there, but they're not necessarily as tied to some of those, you know, showing up Tuesday night type of things as they would have been in the past. And they're just doing it all times a day and, and so on. Uh, versus again, in that peak COVID times of 2020, 2021, people were often going and gravitating towards those group rides and things that were very scheduled. And that was like their one social thing they could you know, attach to for that, that week. Yeah. So well, I guess we'll have to see how peak Zwift day happens for next year and moving forward. I think what's interesting too, is that, you know, with the Wahoo kicker run, they're bringing more exposure to the Zwift platform on yep. for, for different kinds of athletes. I mean, we're, we're certainly not going to see like, you know, an extra couple thousand users, uh, for Zwift run just because of the kicker run, just because they're real, they literally will not be that many kicker run treadmills yeah. out there. But again, it is at least bringing more exposure to the platform. Yeah, absolutely. Mission seeing down the road, especially since 
on Swift running are still free, right? Like of all things, it's kind of crazy. Exactly. And just a quick note to those numbers, I want to thank both uh, ZwiftInsider.com as well as uh, Shane Miller, GP Llama. They've been like the, the not the gatekeepers, but the uh, the old man in the library keeping track of these numbers <laughs> over the years. Um, so the old man Llama, the exact sages. That's a better way of putting it. Llama is not old, but. Um, Point is, I just want to thank both of them for tracking those numbers over the years, um, as well as the people have actually sent in numbers too. So the number, the last kind of highest number for this month was someone finding that exact same or exact moment in time on the screenshot because they do tend to vary a little bit minute to minute. So people might have slightly higher number, but just want to quickly note that to them. Cool. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, Peak Swift Day. And thanks to GP Llama and the rest of you out there. So next up, let's talk about Cora. So they just came out with another round of pretty substantial updates to their watches, basically all their current watches. So there's going to be daily stress monitoring. There's a new wellness check feature. And there's also a new running form test. So with the daily stress monitoring feature, this is going to basically take a lot more samples throughout the day of your heart rate where you're essentially just gonna get this like daily stress figure where you can figure out when during your day is going to be the best time to maybe work out or maybe take a rest. It basically yep. just gonna show your stress trends. There's the wellness check feature. So this is taking multiple health metrics all at one time, including your heart rate, HRV, stress, respiratory rate, and SpO2. And then there's a running form test, which is going to give you a ru specific running form assessment. So it's taking a lot of the metrics that their pod one or pod two accessory already collects, like vertical oscillation, ground contact time, and basically creating an actual report for you of those metrics. So uh, did you, you tried these features out, right? Yep. Yeah, I tried all of them out. Um, so... I'm not sure which one we want. Let's start with the running form one. That's the easiest one. Um, so uh, <laughs> that's not the easiest. It's it is easiest. Yes. Um, so basically, you just go out and run for roughly ten minutes. Um, it's funny. I was like mentally delaying this until I realized it was only ten minutes long. Uh, I'm like, oh, I just got to run for ten minutes. That's that's easy. And enough. it wasn't a um, ramp test either. So it, that's uh, it wasn't <laughs> a ramp test. So much it's easier. Five minutes of warm up and five minutes of like, yeah, kind of mad pace, right? Run, not not like yeah, super slow. Tempo. Just yeah, something. So. Um, on ideally flat ground, which is notable, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, and then at the end of it, you basically get some stats that have this pretty little triangle of different areas to focus on. You do need to have the Chorus Pod 1 or Chorus Pod 2, uh, so you can't just do it with the watch itself. Uh, and like three quarters of those stats are stats that you would have got anyways in normal runs. But you know, the last quarter is this little triangle that um, lets you kind of see on different areas that you want to focus on. So it gives you uh, like a skill area, a strength area, and a balance area, uh, and then different values like ground contact time, et cetera, for each one of those. And those values are ones that have been previously shown on the watch. They're now just in this little evaluation triangle. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, one of the things I've said, whether it be like Garmin's running efficiency stuff, or Chorus is running efficiency, all these companies, there's been a million different running efficiency metric companies out over the last decade or so, is that most of them don't actually give you anything to focus on. They give you a metric and they say, here is your ground contact time. And you're like, that's a cool graph. What do I do with it? Um, I have to give I have to give Chorus a little bit of credit with this because they 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 at least have that little evaluation summary at the bottom of the test where it says that okay you could possibly increase your leg strength because of your the the leg stiffness or something along those lines more than I've seen from Garmin at this point but you know in terms of yep. um, in terms of like actual specifics I. How challenging would it be for a company to be able to say extremely specific things, though, without necessarily taking some of these results to a running coach or a running, you know, uh, a running form assessment coach? And that's that's the problem I have, though, right? And that yeah. essentially it's just we often talk about metrics that are um, I don't know, useless is the wrong word, but there's metrics that just don't really hold water <laughs> from a scientific standpoint. Sure. Um, and I think. Yeah. The underlying data here does. Like, I think ground contact time, et cetera, those trend well with other companies, ground contact, ground contact times. Um, but, like, the evaluation summary, when I look at mine, um, it basically tells me, like, there's a high risk of energy with the and high risk of injury with the current running form. It is recommended to adjust the training volume to the appropriate level. Meanwhile, adjust the foot strike to be closer to the torso and improve the strength reserves or lose weight. It's a lot of recommendations for 
like I've managed to never be injured while running. Like I, and so I've generally speaking, when you look at cycling form and running form, most injuries come from people who try to change their form in one of those two things. Um, and mm. not from like, unless you're injured to begin with, and then you want to mitigate something. Um, and if we look at studies around the most efficient ways to run, um, almost all those studies focus on things, the fact that just run, right? Every time people try to work on all these drills to do different things, it tends to make it worse. Um, so like high cadence drills, things like that are good examples of that, where self-selected cadence is where most current running science is focused on these days. Um, and so I just, and this isn't a hit on Coros, it's really a hit on all these companies in this thing. I think it's why every time I've gone to CES or um, you know, consumer trade shows over the last decade, there is like invariably three to five companies sitting somewhere on the show floor, small company startups showing their latest running form gadget. And I have like boxes and boxes of these gadgets that have like a shelf life of a year or so before the company goes out of business um, quietly. And it's just tough to, to do something that's both scientifically valid that's reasonably priced and that actually has like all the integration that those consumers want. Um, and so this is interesting. It, I'm not like crapping on Corus on this. I just think I wish they would have focused on something else instead. Um, um, yeah, I, I, again, like I think that you can take this information and I think this is really going to be the most beneficial is you, you should take this information to a, uh, running coach. If you see anything that's you know, way offline and uh, <laughs> it's really funny. So, you know, I did this test a few different times and to see if the results were going to be consistent. And it is kind of funny, like <laughs> in terms of like a gamification sort of thing. So the first test, I got like a 76%. I'm like, oh no, oh no, I'm going to go do this test again. So I got like an 82 or something like that. I'm like, okay, I'll take a B, not a C. <laughs> did you change um, anything or just what did you, what, what caused the change? So basically it was the, the primary metric I was looking at, which kind of bumped me down to that C was my stride ratio. So this is your essentially the ratio of your vertical movement to your horizontal movement with each stride. And, you know, that's something that I have, uh, I've been aware of, I guess you could say over time. So that was, again, the metric that bumped me down. So I was just, it, it did make me aware of it for my next test. And that's something I was, you know, top of mind, I guess you could say when I was running. So I did improve that score so again you know so yep. you may be able to take some of these things and, and improve your score again uh in terms of how accurate these metrics are that's something that i do want to go down the rabbit hole at some point on which is going to be a deep deep rabbit hole <laughs> yeah that's a fun rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so anyways that's the running form test and uh next up let's talk about let's say the so basically these two other features the daily stress monitoring as well as the wellness check feature the same sort of feature that garmin has called health snapshot where it's taking all these metrics at one time and you can do these at certain points in the day that you where you want to have a certain baseline on all these metrics let's say before your workout in the morning, after your workout, so on and so forth. And that way you can get some historical trends on these at certain points of the day. And then the daily stress monitoring feature, you could very well use this to gauge again, like, you know, what is maybe causing stress during the day? When is the best time to work out? When is the best time to rest? So, but I, I do appreciate that they are branching out into more of these wellness and recovery aspects um, because Chorus has been certainly a sports focused watch for a long time. So this is definitely helping them kind of expand their offering uh, for a broader audience. Yeah, I think it's it's good to see them add those in there. Um, I think they, the wellness check is a really simple, easy way to, of doing that. Uh, the stress measurement piece is pretty similar to what we've seen elsewhere. Um, and I'll give them credit. They did take my feedback on my post uh, pretty quickly. So one of the criticisms I had about their stress management feature is that it include your workout, your exercise time. Um, so if you went out and did a workout, uh, it included that in their their charts, their graphs, their numbers, their averages, et cetera. The problem is that 
the stress um, basically values anytime we work out was just simply 100%. It was basically full on, it showed stress the entire time. Um, and to me, that makes the feature essentially useless because the idea behind theoretically going out for a workout is stress reduction. If you're talking about stress in terms of like the human mind stress, it's usually reduced through workouts. If you're talking about stressors on the body, that is simply increased with workouts, right? You're basically fatigued. But fatigue and stress levels are two different things. And so I think Chorus was confusing those a bit. Um, and I kind of made a comment like this Chorus tried to copy this feature, but didn't understand the feature when I copied it. Um, and to their credit, within like 24 hours, they sent me a note back and said, no, you're right. We're going to, we're going to change this and we're going to remove, um, workout time periods from the stress, um, system because it doesn't make sense because they count for those in training load and fatigue there instead. Right. So training load and recovery is where you would properly account for workout stressors as opposed to like, are you stressed out about, you know, whatever it is you have going on in life. So it's good to see that they, they've kind of, um, you know, change their, their thinking pretty quickly there. And that's, I guess, the point of a, a beta as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so those are another round of Chorus updates for 2024. Eager to hear what Chorus has slated for the rest of the year. Next up, let's talk about Fossil quitting the smartwatch game. So I think January 26th or so, mm -hmm. they made an announcement that they're going to be leaving the smartwatch market. So they've been actually making Wear OS watches or smartwatches basically since 2015. And it's one of the only consistent companies that, that's actually been making Wear OS watches that entire time. So there's been companies, Samsung, LG, Sony, Motorola, as well as Asus <laughs> that have mm -hmm. made watches here and there over the years. But yeah, Fossil's actually quitting the smartwatch game. So I think their Gen 6 or something like that is going to be the last generation of Fossil Wear OS watch. But I think the bigger question is why they're leaving the smartwatch game. And what are your thoughts on that? That's a, a Fossil in smartwatches in Google is like this weird, it's a weird fight club sort of thing, right? Like Fossil, you know, has bought various smart wearable things over the years um misfit being a company that you know had a little like round pucks thing that you you wore with the lights on it for a number of years they bought them and then at some point along the way back into the 19 google bought um a whole bunch of unknown tech from fossil for smartwatches it sounds like that was for like a patent thing more than anything else um but google and fossil have always had this like sort of secretish relationship behind the scenes on what they're licensing back and forth um, and in exchange for that, Fossils had seemingly better access to, to Wear OS uh, in terms of development resources, et cetera, and being able to get things from Google than other companies have had. Obviously, Fossil knows their business better. Like, they know their numbers better than you and I do. Um, uh, and I unquestionably, Fossil is losing business to smartwatches around the world. Like, most, unlike you and I that are wearing two watches, most people only wear one watch. And so, um, when it comes down to you know, their business, their Apple and Samsung and Google and Garmin and everyone else is taking their money. Um, and maybe they decided they just simply could not compete from a smartwatch standpoint. And they obviously have said in their statement, they want to focus on their traditional watches. I question the long term. Like if you put the arc of like 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, does that work out? Like, can you really sustain being a watch company? outside of like the the classic watches right but by not having any and for a company as big as fossil with as many brands as they have and you know options to not have any smart option i don't know if that's going to work in like a, a long vision sort of sort of thing i think we're <laughs> we're a bit biased on our opinions on this but you know in my opinion i think the smart watch is easily going to be one of the most important consumer devices moving forward for so many reasons. Connectivity, health, uh, fitness, there's there's so many reasons. In terms of why Fossil is leaving the industry, you know, in terms of the whole Google plus Fossil relationship, I think we have to talk about Samsung in that uh, realm yeah. as well, just because um, with Wear OS 4, it's basically Google plus Samsung holding hands with Wear yeah. OS 4. And at this point, I believe the Pixel Watch and the Samsung watches are the only Wear OS 4 watches out there. And in terms of Wear OS 3 watches, 
that was a pretty short list as well. So we yeah. had uh, Mobvoy, Tag Hauer, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that, Razor, Skagen, but it was a very short list of Wear OS 3 watches as well. So I think the Wear OS 4 um, hand-holding relationship with Samsung and Google is certainly another big reason why Fossil is leaving the smartwatch game. Do you think Wear OS has something to do with that as well as like in terms of adoption across the industry? So we just talked about how, you know, Wear OS 3 watches, that was a short list, but Wear OS 4, that's even a shorter list. So, you know, compared to something like an Apple Watch, Wear OS always has seemed like it's a little bit lost. Yeah, I think that's a fair, fair statement. I uh, I wonder, I mean, obviously Samsung's figured out their, we've talked about this, I think last week briefly, but they figured out their place in life for the Samsung Galaxy Watch as a upsell to drive their watches, right? Or sorry, drive their phones as opposed to being like a standalone thing that they, they are really heavily focused on by itself. Whereas Apple sees it, obviously there's that, that again, that same requirement that Apple has around you, know, you have to have an iPhone totally. to have an Apple Watch. Totally. Um, but it's a less of a, those two are less paired in terms of driving sales of the iPhone, right? They they want to sell the watch and they want to sell you the phone, but they want to sell you both at ideally close to full retail price, where Samsung wants to sell you the phone. And if you want to watch, sure, you can have one too, right? Um, and I wonder, obviously that I think impacts other competitors that come into that space. And when you have Samsung more or less giving away watches, um, either for training programs or giving away them elsewhere, that really hurts that larger Wear OS ecosystem. Um, and I think it also even hurts Google uh, in terms of wanting to really commit on things like the Pixel Watch. And when you look at the Pixel Watch, though, I, as we've talked about in the past, uh, outside of this anyways, the biggest challenge there is still, I think, actually just the size, right? I think they have to, right now, they don't have a physical form factor offering that drives almost that the nerdy tech community into into really grappling with that and running with it and then you know that whole like grassroots thing happening um that does ironically enough exist in some way on the samsung side um and so i think that contributes to your, your original question of like is there this element of Wear OS being lost and i think it's it feels lost because there isn't like there isn't this brave heart moment of someone that's running across the field of like this is the thing that we're we're on you know what i mean like it just there mm -hmm. it feels like at times there isn't something that everyone can rally around um as a uh, you know and no matter versus if you look at other watch brands in this realm there's always that rallying watch out there that people can rally around and have you know deep community fandoms of etc that just doesn't seem to exist yet for pixel watch yeah um and going back to Samsung with their Samsung phones. So we have Google and they have a unique offering as well as that. So they have a lot of, you know, tight Fitbit integration because they own Fitbit at this point. So when we're looking at the Pixel Watch, you kind of have a unique offering of Google offering Fitbit functionality. And then with Samsung, you have Samsung offering unique functionality with their Samsung Galaxy phones. And that leaves Fossil in a really tough place because they don't necessarily have a unique offering for the industry that <laughs> makes them stand out like each of those companies do. So Fossil, you know, they were just in a really tough place. And in terms of like what's actually gonna grab a consumer, I'm not necessarily sure. And again, going back to the what you brought up about, you know, as we move forward, the classical timepiece <laughs> market versus smartwatches, uh, I'll be curious where they are in five years. Yep. No, it, it, it reminds me a little bit of a conversation I had with uh, one of like the lead watch leads, if you will, the basically the, the guy over uh, Sunto's watch division um, for the sports mm. watches back like maybe five years ago, something like that. Um, it was right after Garmin had introduced uh, music on whatever the first watch was they introduced it on. Um, and this was like a few months later. We were out running somewhere in, in Finland. I was up visiting their headquarters or something. And he asked me in the middle of the run, he's like, what do you think about the music side? What do you think about this and that? And is this something we should look at, et cetera? And I said, if you look at the arc of your watches over the next 
two, five, ten years. And if you as a company, as soon as it's been around for a long, long time, right? So two, five, ten years is nothing in that arc of how long they've been around as a company. Can you imagine a scenario where in ten years you wouldn't have music on your watches and every other watch in the world does? Can you imagine that? And he's like, no, we would have it. Then I'm like, well, probably should start now then, right? Like it, and it's, it's, I feel like in some ways it's kind of the, the challenge with, with fossils, the same sort of thing. Um, and I suppose the difference though is what is fossils plan for that market segment? If there is any plan at all, is it simply say, you know what, we want to be classical timepiece only, and that's all we care about then cool. I think we'll have to though deal with the reality that that means a smaller, you know, overall revenue pie. Like it's as simple as that. Um, and, and in any industry, there's winners and losers over time as technology shifts happen. And that just may be one of them. Uh, bringing up the music, that's actually great just because, you know, to be clear, we're certainly talking about like Wear OS watches now. There are plenty of Android compatible watches. I mean, Garmin, Koro, oh, yeah. Student 2, like all, like all these watches are Android compatible. It's just that we're, we're basically just talking about watches that are on the Wear OS platform. But that does bring up a really good, uh, really good topic with the music, though, is that, you know, for these companies like, let's say, Chorus or Suunto to make a relationship directly with, let's say, Spotify, probably nearly impossible. And it's impossible now. Where, In 2024, yeah, it's impossible. So, yeah, exactly. So, you know, where where OS comes into play is that, well, there's a Spotify app on Wear OS. So that kind of eliminates the relationship that they would have to directly build with one of those companies. So that's where, uh, that's one advantage to going to a Wear OS operating system is that you can tie into those third-party apps and you get a lot more, uh, just you can expand your portfolio in terms of features drastically. However, again, you know, one of the big drawbacks with Wear OS historically has been battery life and how that actually works with, you know, these other companies that do also have proprietary operating systems. You know, we even saw Samsung ditch Tizen to go to Wear OS 4. So again, it's like for the for these companies to tie into that, well, they would pretty much have to go with, you know, Wear OS or nothing. Yeah, if I was if I was in the CEO of Chorus's role or Polar or of Sunto, keep on building those traditional watches that have crazy battery lives for the 5% of the population that wants to go out and run, you know, for 100 hours. I think that's, and, or wants to be able to recharge every week or two. That's that's great. Like that's that's certainly a core group of people and, and you and I and fall in that camp with whatever watches we're using and wanting that long battery life. But there is a huge group of people that want to have all those same sports features on a true smartwatch, right? With all the integration that comes with Wear OS and that that market is there. I just, I look at like, I think Suunto had that idea with the Suunto 7 where there was, you know, Wear OS. And obviously that was a time where battery life wasn't great, but a lot of people liked that nonetheless and said, you know what? I don't need to go on a 12 or 14 hour hike or adventure. I need to go on a three to four hour adventure and last the rest of the day in battery life. And Suunto eventually got there, but they never got there with porting the rest of their platform over to Wear OS. So you essentially had this really scraped down version of a Suunto watch um, on the Wear OS, which wasn't really what people wanted. They wanted the full Suunto sport experience on the Wear OS and go from there. And that's where I, again, if you look at the long arc of things and go, will Google eventually figure out battery life in Wear OS? Yeah, probably, right? I mean, if they if they don't, that essentially just leaves Apple left in terms of having a you know true smartwatch, as people like to call it. So I don't think Google's going to abandon that uh, at any point in time. Uh, Google abandons lots of things, but I don't think they're going to abandon Wear OS as a, as a concept. Um, so I just, I look at that and go, I think over time they will slowly figure this out. They have slowly figured it out. Like the battery life on the, the latest Samsung watches is a heck of a lot better than it's ever been in the past. Um, and even the Pixel Watch too, right? The Pixel Watch battery this year is, is improved over years past. So I don't know. I think it's just an area that I would invest resources in. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's going to be interesting year to see what Google is going to come out with their Pixel Watch and what else comes out in the Wear OS uh, space. So lastly, let's talk about Garmin taking a little jab at Apple or a big jab in a, <laughs> a few different ways. So I didn't this see brings this. Us, so what's, what's this all about? You didn't, you didn't, see, ready. You didn't see this? Okay. I, 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 yeah. So this brings us back to our last episode. So 
If you didn't hear, Apple has uh, removed the blood oxygen monitoring feature from their Series 9 and their Ultra 2s starting uh, middle of January-ish, basically, because right. they lost an appeal with Mossimo uh, on that feature. So they've had to remove that feature from currently selling Series 9 and Ultra 2 smartwatches. Garmin, they're not necessarily too cheeky <laughs> with most of their social posts or something like that but they do tend to get cheeky at times. And uh, I'll go ahead and send you these screenshots, but on Garmin social media, they've been plugging SPO2 pretty heavily. So, <laughs> so basically- I haven't seen it. Yeah, I haven't noticed anyways. You, you, you have not seen this. Yeah, so basically I have screenshots right here. Yesterday, they have a, on their Instagram stories for their Venue 3, Pulse OX has uh -huh. its perks. And then let's see here. Couple days ago, yeah, another <laughs> Garmin post on the Foreigner 265 uh, blood oxygen is big. So yeah, they've been um, they've been tossing these little cheeky little reminders, I guess you could say, that yeah. they do have blood oxygen in their watches. I, I uh, interesting. Yeah, we've seen them like you said a few times. Every once in a while, they'll poke back. Uh, you know, Garmin tends to be a very like like you said a very um, a conservative company, not in the political sense, but in the like the base term of the word, right? In terms of just not not generally rattling too much, but every once in a while they do they do poke a little bit. So uh, yeah, it's interesting terms. So yeah, so that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the FitFile podcast. So next week uh, or the next episode, uh, we are trying to get these episodes out. Hopefully, once a week, three times a month. So basically, it's really going to depend on like the news that's out there. But for the next episode, so the Apple Vision Pro, uh, the at least some of the unboxing videos and whatnot have literally come out today. Uh, um, so we're going to talk about the Apple Vision Pro. We're going to talk about a little bit more winter training and some other stuff in the indoor space. Anything else that you wanted to bring up for next week? No, I think uh, depending on our definition of next week, we will see exactly what is included in this episode. I think we're starting to see like things warm up for the, the spring time period uh, in terms of new products and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think we'll, um, we've got our, we got our potential notes here, but it depends on exactly what day we decide to record and whether or not the recording will come out before or after other embargoes. But uh, we should have, should have some good stuff coming. Yep, again. So great. Yeah. So, and again, a uh, reminder to check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, as well as new YouTube music where you can actually switch back and forth between the video and audio formats. And I think something kind of fun I'll just go ahead and bring up at the end here is that so we didn't necessarily have expectations on, you know, where this podcast would land. We, we essentially just wanted to talk about all this stuff publicly, I guess you could say, that we talk about behind the scenes. But uh, fun fact, on our first episode over on Spotify, we had uh, we had some unexpected results. So you, you kind of popped over there, and, and what did you find? Yeah, I logged into Spotify account. I was looking at stuff. I finally figured out how to log into Spotify account, the analytics side of it, um, and got in there. And it said that we had managed to break the top 20 um, tech podcast in the U.S. Uh, last week. And then in the UK, broke the top 10. Um, so yeah, unexpected. We also, I think, broke the top 10 in Germany as well. Um, but uh, uh, we don't even speak German. How's that? So, um, <laughs> but <laughs> we uh, know it's kind of a nice little surprise there. So definitely appreciate everyone that's listened on whatever platform you listen on. Uh, doesn't definitely. really matter to us. That all funnels into somewhere. So, um, but uh, yeah, thanks for listening to the podcast. And again, Keep on giving us that feedback or taking it as best as we can and kind of pulling in and updating stuff, whether it be microphones or video or yeah. um, more additional show notes, stuff like that. We're working through all those things as we can. And yeah, and we definitely got a lot of good feedback on our YouTube comments last week. So we're definitely taking those to heart and we're going to try to improve these episodes moving forward. So definitely leave your suggestions down there. So that's it for this week's episode of the FitFile podcast. And we will see you in the next episode. Yep. Thanks for listening or watching. <laughs>